welcome to AP US History, or as I like to say, A Push with Lennox. Today we're talking about World War I, which occurred right in the beginning of the 20th century, roughly 1914 to 1918. And it's going to completely change America and our role in the world. So let's go ahead and get started and get over to our slideshow. Now, when we talk about this, what I want you to remember is who was president at the time. And the president is going to be Woodrow Wilson. Now, Woodrow Wilson became president in 1912 following a division of the Republican Party. If you remember correctly, Taft was the sitting president, and yet T.R., Teddy Roosevelt, was not happy with the job he was going to do. When T.R. failed to receive the Republican nomination for president, he started his own party, the Progressives, also known as the Bull Moose. Now, during the election of 1912, you're going to see the Republican Party split, and Woodrow Wilson, the Democratic candidate, will win the presidency. Now, what's fascinating about Woodrow Wilson is when it came to domestic policies, there was no one better. But when it came to foreign policy, he had no experience at all. In fact, he kind of joked at one point saying, would it be ironic if my president was centered around foreign policy? Well, Woodrow, welcome to World War I. As we get started, as usual, let's review the terminology of this time period. A lot of different things you should know. Uh, remember, if there's a few words you don't know, go ahead and pause the video, write those down, and pick them up as we go through this lecture. Now, first of all, we got to look at why did we get involved? Because remember, America was still holding on to that isolationist mentality, going all the way back to George Washington and the proclamation of neutrality. But we're going to see our neutrality violated on several occasions, primarily by the Germans. Now, the Germans wanted, um, you know, basically, use their power in the oceans to try to control ships going to and from the allied powers of Great Britain and France and other places. And so we're going to see the violations in the sinking of the Lusitania and the Sussex. Now, these were ships that belonged to uh, Great Britain and France, respectively, but there were Americans on board those ships. And so that's when America is going to start at looking at the possibility of our involvement in the war. But just the sinking of these two ships isn't going Going to do it. It's going to be a series of events that will pull us into the war. Now, Germany tries to work with us. They're going to sign what's known as the Sussex Pledge. And that pledge basically said that they were going to stop using unrestricted war submarine warfare on neutral vessels. In the meantime, the Great Britain um, spies are going to intercept a telegram that is being sent to Mexico from Germany. And what Germany is trying to do is incite Mexico to basically distract the United States, invade the United States, if you will. And if they're able to keep the U.S. out of the war, and once Germany wins, Germany promises to return lands to Mexico that had been taken from them following the Mexican-American War. I mean, we're going all the way back to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the best treaty in the world. Well, when Americans get word of this, we're not too happy. And then you couple that with the fact that the Germans say, you know what, that whole Sussex pledge, yeah, we're not doing that anymore. We're going back to unrestricted submarine warfare. With that, Wilson asked Congress for a declaration of war. In his war message, though, he is going to say there's another reason we're going to fight, and that was to make the world safe. For democracy. And you're going to see that theme later when we talk about his 14 points, but we got to get to that first. Uh, initially, the United States was not ready for this war. We had to mobilize right away. We initiated a draft, the Selective Service Act. This will be the second time in our U.S. history that a draft is used. Um, over a million troops are going to be drafted. They're going to become what's known as the American Expeditionary Force, and they will be sent to fight over in Europe under General John Blackjack Pershing. Here at home, we're going into what's known as a total war scenario, meaning every part of our society is going to be focused on the war effort. We start by selling war bonds, also known as liberty loans. This is to raise money for the war efforts. And we're going to start using income taxes to pay for the war. By this point, the 16th Amendment has been passed, so income taxes are part of our normal life now. Um, different agencies will be set up during this time, including the National War Labor Board, the War's Industry Board, and the U.S. Food Administration. 
Now, the National Ward Labor Board, their job is to keep industry going and to work with unions and to work with uh, ownership to keep those factories up and running. That was pretty easy with the AFL because they supported the war and said we should not go on strike during this time period. But unions like the IWW, started by Eugene Debs, they basically said, no, we'll go on strike if we have to whenever, wartime or not. The War Industries Board, they were overseeing production. Every factory in America went to wartime production, producing weapons, producing munitions, anything you would need to fight a war, our factories were making. And finally, the U.S. Food Administration, they oversaw the conservation efforts of food. You know, having people save it at home, in, uh, encouraging victory gardens and stuff like that so we could keep our soldiers fed overseas. What's interesting during this time is the 18th Amendment is also going to be passed and ratified. And it's going to gain a lot of steam because of this war effort. We see the enemy, in this case, the Germans, and the Germans you know, were tied to beer and everything like that. And so to get back at the Germans, I guess we said, hey, why don't we just prohibit all alcohol, including beer? Just a little side note for you there. We also didn't want to hear anybody talking against the war. And so you're going to have committees like the Committee of Public Information that their job is to get out as much positive information about this war as they can. A lot of propaganda posters went out, both for the war and against the enemies. We also had what was called Four Minute Men. These were celebrities of the time that were put out in public where they would give four minute speeches on the benefits of this war and get the people behind them. Uh, to prevent uh, bad talk or to prevent anything negative to get out about the war, we're going to pass the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act. Now, the Sedition Act is the one I want to talk about because this is the one that made it illegal to talk negatively about our government or about our war efforts. And so you're going to see this is very common in time of war. A lot of time our civil liberties are usually frozen under the umbrella of public safety. And also we're going to see this rise of anti-German sentiment. I mentioned the whole beer drinking thing leading to prohibition. What we're trying to do is dehumanize the enemy. And if you look at that poster right there to the right of that, you can see that we're not even referring to them as Germans. We're calling them Huns. And I want you to look at that demonic face that they put on the Hun. By, by depicting the enemy this way, you're dehumanizing him and you're making it more against going against these monsters and evil instead of going against human beings. Uh, one case that's going to come out of this, especially the Sedition Act, is going to be Schenck versus the United States. Schenck is going to be uh, charged with violating the Sedition Act when he sends out a lot of anti-draft notices through the mail. When he is convicted or you know, charged with this crime, he is going to sue the uh, government saying that their action was unconstitutional. The Supreme Court, under the leadership of Oliver Wendell Holmes, is going to rule against Schenck and say, no, Congress absolutely has the power to restrain free speech if it presents a clear and present danger. It's during this case that we hear the argument against, you know, or the argument for restraining free speech. We're saying you wouldn't allow someone to run into a crowded theater and yell fire because that would cause panic and that would cause harm. That's what the argument was against Shank in this. And that was what the argument was for in the Sedition Acts. You don't want to incite, uh, you know, um, talk or conversation or articles in the newspaper that would cause fear in America and cause panic. It's about public safety. Here on the home front, a lot of different things were happening. A lot of different changes were taking place. For African Americans during this time was when the Great Migration starts. They're being pushed out of the South by the Jim Crow laws, and they're being pulled to the North by job opportunities and factories and new skills and stuff like that. So you see a lot of African Americans moving to urban centers in the North. Uh, Detroit, New York, Chicago, Cleveland, all of these areas, that's where they're, what's being, they're being attracted to with jobs in the factories. During World War I, you're also going to see um, a lot of African Americans serve in segregated unions, near uh, units. Uh, I should say units, sorry about that. Um, 
nearly 400,000 African Americans serve in the U.S. Armed Forces during World War I. Now, W.E.B. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington, they thought this was a good thing. They thought that this, you know, through this, we would see African Americans elevated in society towards that equality they've been driving for. It doesn't happen as fast as they would like. In fact, we're going to see race riots later in the, you know, after the war due to a lot of these African Americans who had moved north. Women were working in the factories as well. Uh, they don't have the fame and the fortune of the Rosie the Riveter of the World War II, but they absolutely contributed to the war effort. And with that contribution, that gives them the final push to finally get the eight, 19th Amendment ratified. That's when they got the right to vote nationally. Now, you did have women who had the right to vote throughout the country at this point. In fact, it was Wyoming who gave the first to give women the right to vote in the year of 1869. However, with the passage of the 19th Amendment, it is now national law that women have the right to vote. At the end of the war, the war comes to an end. I hope I'm not spoiling it for you, but we won. Um, Wilson is going to take part in the treaty negotiations over in Versailles in France. His goal is to create a plan that would prevent all future wars. We call it his 14-point plan. And while there were obviously 14 points, the big ones were freedom of the seas, uh, to eliminate economic trade barriers throughout the world, for all countries to reduce their um, size of the military, as well as the alliances they had built with other countries. Because remember, alliances was one of the key uh, contributors to the start of World War I. And um, the, the big thing he really wanted to push was this League of Nations, a league that would oversee all the countries of the world to help maintain the peace. And his idea going into this was this perception of peace without victory. We don't have to declare winners and losers because if we follow my 14 points, we all come out winners. Well, the members of the contingency from the other countries who fought with the allies or, you know, wanted nothing to do with this. Uh, France, England, other countries, they said, oh, no. Someone needs to pay for this war, and that someone was going to be Germany. Under Article 151, they were going to hold Germany responsible for the entire war, and Germany is going to have to end up paying war reparations and such to these European countries. And this is going to cause a problem that's going to continue into the 1930s, and due to the, the negotiations at the Treaty of Versailles, we will see the rise of Hitler as he takes advantage of the Depression and the frustration that Germans have after World War I. The Treaty of Versailles is not going to be centered completely around the 14 points of Woodrow Wilson. In fact, a lot of those points were rejected. The big one that wasn't, though, was the League of Nations. But here's the problem that Wilson faced. When he went and negotiated the Treaty of Versailles, he went on his own. He didn't take any members of Congress. And remember, the Constitution says that the president has the power to negotiate treaties with the advice and consent of Congress. And he didn't ask for that. So when he comes back with this plan, he's going to have a lot of pushback, especially from Republicans. And unfortunately for Wilson, during the midterm elections of 1918, the Republicans have gained control of Congress now. Their big problem was the League of Nations. They worried that as a, a member of the League of Nations, that the United States would be governed by an outside body because Article 10 of the, the Treaty of Versailles basically said that the League would have the power to help others, in, you know, each other in case of attack or something like that, and the League would control who would be involved. The last thing U.S. government officials wanted was the United States to lose control of their foreign relations. So you're going to have two groups of people in Congress. You're going to have the reservationists, led by Henry Cabot Lodge, and the irreconcilables. The reservationists believed that the Treaty of Versailles could be ratified with some modifications. Um, and the irreconcilable said, no, there is no, you know, accepting of this treaty. It's all garbage. Well, Wilson wants nothing to do with either side. He wants it signed as is, and he's going to go on a nationwide tour trying to get people to get, you know, the people to get behind the treaty. Unfortunately, he's going to suffer a stroke during this time. Congress is going to reject the League of Nations, and Wilson is going to see his last days 
as he's going to look at himself as a failure because he went and negotiated this on good faith and he couldn't even get his own government to support him in this. Now, what, after Wilson dies, he actually is awarded the uh, Nobel Pre Peace Prize for his uh, involvement in the negotiations of the Treaty of Versailles. And, and it was still in place because, remember, the European nations did sign this treaty. Just America, they rejected it. That's going to be it for World War I. Our next venture is going to be into the Roaring Twenties. So I'll look forward to seeing to you then. I'll see you next time. Have a great day. Bye-bye.